So in section 2.1, and we're going to start off by talking about the atomic theory of John Dalton. The first concept of an atom came from like ancient Greece, and the word came from the Greek word for indivisible. And basically what they were thinking about was like if you had a piece of lead, say, and you cut it in half. Well, then you have two pieces of lead, both with the same kind of properties. But what if you just kept doing that, cutting it into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces? They theorized that at some point you would wind up with a uh, piece that was so small that when you cut it in half, it would no longer have the properties of lead. Uh, they were on the right track, but this wasn't really formalized in any way until 1807 by an English school teacher named John Dalton. Dalton's atomic theory has uh, five postulates. The first is that matter is ex composed of exceedingly small particles called atoms. An atom is the smallest unit of element that can participate in a chemical change. It's the smallest unit of an element that has the properties of that element. The second is that an element consists of only one type of atom, which has a mass that is characteristic of the element and is the same for all atoms in, of that element. So every atom of copper, for instance, weighs the same amount, and that's why every penny of roughly the same size is going to weigh the same amount. His third postulate is that atoms of one element differ in properties from the atoms of all other elements. The fourth is that a compound consists of atoms of two or more elements combined in a small whole number ratio. In a given compound, the number of atoms of each of its elements are always present in the same ratio. So he was really trying to explain how we have all this myriad of different materials when we know that it's all based on just a small set of elements. So in our example here, we have copper oxide. We can see that this is composed of both copper and oxygen in a regular pattern. For every copper, there is one oxygen atom, and they arrange themselves together in a definite pattern. The fifth postulate is that atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change, but they instead only rearrange to make different other compounds. So Dalton's theory uh, led to a very important conclusion here called the law of conservation of matter. If the atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change, then the total mass of matter present when, uh, should remain the same. Um, we should have the same mass of products plus uh, as we had the initial reactants. For this chapter, we're going to assume that our chemical reactions complete, uh, completely convert to products. That will make our lives a lot easier. In this case, the initial mass of the reactants is going to equal the mass of the products. In practice, though, reactions really don't go all the way to completion. You always wind up with at least some of the reactants left over. In this case, you're going to have the initial mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products, the things that you made, plus the mass of the leftover reactants that didn't react. Next, we have the law of definite proportions, or the law of, con of constant compositions. This states that all samples of a pure compound contain the same elements in the same proportion by mass. So we can see that this is illustrated here where we have equal number in the first example here of uh, green balls and blue balls. And we wind up with a product that has equal number of green and blue balls. In the second example, we have twice as many green balls as blue balls. And we wind up with a product that has twice as many green as blue balls. 
constant composition. So we can actually put a little bit of math to that. And we can in here, if we look at our example here, we took the exact same compound, isooctane, and we had different masses for three different samples. When we go and test for the amount of carbon and hydrogen that's contained in it, we wind up getting differing amounts of carbon and differing amounts of hydrogen. But the ratio of carbon to hydrogen, if I divide the amount of carbon by the amount of hydrogen, is always the same. There's always 5.33 grams of carbon for every one gram of hydrogen. So they have a, a constant composition. The next conclusion is something called the law of multiple proportions. This states that when two elements react to form one more than one compound, a fixed mass of one element will react with the masses of the other element in a ratio of small whole numbers. That's a little confusing, so let's look at our example here. If we have two different compounds, both containing chlorine and copper, and we have a so we have our green solid and we have our brown solid if we took the ratios of chlorine to copper and then we divided those two we see that the brown solid has two chlorines for every one chlorine that's down here in our green solid that means that the brown solid has twice as many chlorines we can picture that here, where we can see here there is roughly one chlorine or two chlorines for every one copper, whereas over here we have twice as many chlorines as we did on the left. In section 2.2, we're going to talk about some famous experiments that led us to the discovery of the subatomic particles that make up atoms. We're going to begin with J.J. Thompson. He was experimenting with cathode ray tubes. These are like these sealed glass tubes where you remove all the air inside of them. They contain two metal electrodes which you charge with high voltage. When you do that, uh, something called a cathode ray appears between the two um, electrodes. Uh, these were used widely in the past for uh, CRT televisions, those old school televisions where a cathode ray tube was used to focus the beam, the cathode ray onto the glass to make the image. What Thompson discovered is that regardless of the metals that he used for the electrodes, this beam was always deflected towards the positive charge and away from a negative charge. He was able to calculate the charge to mass ratio by figuring out how much voltage was required and carefully measuring how much deflection he had of the cathode ray particles. Here's an image of the kind of setup that he was using. You can see down here, he's focusing this cathode ray, and then he's able to deflect it using these um, charged plates here. What did Thompson discover? He discovered that his cathode ray particles were much lighter than atoms. These particles had a negative charge, which is why they were deflected away from the negative charge and towards a positive. These particles are indistinguishable regardless of the source of the material. So that means that they were inside of every different kind of um, metal that he was trying to use for those electrodes. This cathode ray particle is what, uh, is what we now call electrons. He was focusing on electrons um, and being able to deflect them. And we now know that these are subatomic particles with very, very small masses, much smaller than the total atom. And they actually do make up all of the different um, element atoms. They're at least one part. The next uh, experiment was by Robert Millikan with his oil drop experiment. What he was doing was taking microscopic, really tiny oil droplets, and he was able to electrically charge them. 
He then exposed them to an external electric field and he was able to slow or even reverse them. Like they were dropping down and he was actually able to slow them down as they were dropping. And what he was really trying to do was get them to hover there. Because by being able to hover them inside of his apparatus, he could figure out how much... Uh, charge difference he needed between these two plates. He knew the difference in uh, distance between the droplet and the plates. And he was able to use something called Coulomb's Law to figure out the charge on each one of the droplets. When he did that, he uh, was getting values that look something like this in this table. And what he figured out is that all of these values have a common divisor, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So what he figured was that there was some sort of particle in there that had this charge, and there were different amounts of these in each one of the oil droplets that was leading to the different charges that he had. Um, since Thompson had already showed that electrons, he, we already knew their charge to mass ratio, it's pretty trivial to figure out the mass of the electron then. So we have the coulombs that Mulliken found. We can multiply or actually divide that by the charge to mass ratio that Thompson found here. And we find that an electron weighs 9.107 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, which is really, 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 really small. Not much mass at all. The next experiment was by Ernest Rutherford, um, where he was focusing a beam of alpha particles. These are two protons and two neutrons um, together. I had a piece of gold foil. He actually didn't know what alpha particles were made at, but he was going to shoot them at this gold foil. He did know that the alpha particles were positively charged. And then he started to look at the scattering. Where did these alpha particles go after they hit the gold foil? So let's take a look at his experiment here. He has his radium here, highly radioactive stuff. Uh, source of our alpha particles. He's focusing this beam out. And what he was really expecting to happen was for these to bounce back, much like a ball hitting a wall. If this is a solid, why shouldn't it just deflect back? But to his surprise, most of these alpha particles just passed right on through. A few were deflected um, here, and a, only a very small amount actually bounced back. So what conclusions can we draw from that? He concluded that the volume occupied by an atom must consist of a large amount of empty space. The majority of that material was empty space that allowed the alpha particles to pass right through. Um, he decided that there was a small, relatively heavy, positively charged body that was actually able to deflect or in some cases even um, cause the alpha particles to bounce off of. He coined the term nucleus, and he said that this would be at the center of the atoms, much like the sun is at the center of the solar system. He theorized that the nucleus contains most of the atom's mass, um, since we already knew that electrons were relatively small masses. This is pretty reasonable. Um, and then he said that the negatively charged electrons are going to surround this big nuca nucleus. He also theorized that there was a uh, particle in there called the proton, which was positively charged. Um, this is going to offset the negative charge on the electrons, as we saw that elements are neutral. We can kind of picture what's happening with the gold foil experiment here. As alpha particles are coming in, sometimes they kind, kind of get close to the nucleus and they kind of bounce off in a weird direction. Every once in a while, they manage to hit one and then deflect back. But for the most part, they just go straight on through, never uh, coming anywhere near a nucleus. Isotopes. 
Isotopes are atoms of the same element that differ in mass. So we actually do have elements that have different masses. This is in contradictions to Dalton's theory, but the difference in mass is so minute, he really didn't have a good way of measuring that at the time. In order to justify that, we have neutrons. These are uncharged subatomic particles. Um, with a mass that is approximately the same as protons. So in order to get these slightly different masses, we have to have some other kind of particle that has some kind of significant mass that is different between the two atoms, but is not charged. It's not participating and creating charges. In section 2.3, Three, we're going to talk about uh, how to write and interpret the symbols that depict the atomic number, mass number, and charge of an atom. These are used to describe the atomic uh, structure of the atom. We're going to define the atomic mass unit and the average atomic mass, and then we're going to do some calculations. So, as we've seen, the nucleus contains the majority of the atom's mass. Protons and neutrons are much heavier than electrons. Electrons occupy most of the atom's volume. They're actually pretty far away on the scale of this from the center of that nucleus. If the diameter of an atom is approximately 10 to the negative 10 meters, the diameter of a nucleus is only 10 to the negative 15 meters. To put that in perspective, if an electron is uh, flowing around a baseball stadium, the nucleus would only be the size of a blueberry at the very center. And everything in between those is going to be empty space. So atoms and subatomic particles are really small. They have really small values. Um, to make this convenient to write, we're going to define some small units um, that mean that we don't have to express everything with these really large negative exponents. Uh, so we start off with the atomic mass unit, AMU. 1 AMU is 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. And this is pretty convenient. So like now the mass of carbon 12, for instance, can be described as just 12 AMUs. Um, and then we have our fundamental unit of charge, which is just the electron. And the electron is going to be equal to the charge of an electron in Coulombs. This number that Mulliken came up with, 1.602 times 10 to negative 19 Coulombs. So, to give you some perspective here, one proton is roughly one AMU, 1.0073 AMU. It has a charge of plus one. A neutron is slightly heavier, heavier at 1.0087 AMU. It has a z no charge on it. And an electron is much, much smaller at 0 0.00055 AMU, negative one charge. Atomic number. So the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. This is the defining trait of an element. Okay, All elements that have an atomic number that have six protons are always going to be carbon. All elements that have, say, eight uh, protons with an atomic number of eight, those are all going to be oxygen. So neutral atoms. In order for the atom to be neutral, we need the same number of positive and negative charges. Okay, so that means that if you are dealing with a neutral atom, you only have to talk about the number of protons, and then we can assume that there is an equal number of electrons to counterbalance that. Mass number. The total number of protons and neutrons in the atom is called its mass number. So we saw that 
Protons and neutrons have the majority of the mass. When you add them together, really the mass of the electron is negligible. So we'll define their mass number as just the number of protons and neutrons. Also, because they have they are all roughly one AMU, the mass number is going to be really close to the actual atomic mass. So in order to get the number of neutrons, what we need to do is subtract the mass number or su subtract the atomic number from the mass number. So our atomic number is the number of protons. Our mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Subtracting them gives us the number of neutrons. So when the protons and electrons are not equal, the atom is electrically charged, and we call this an ion. We can figure out what the charge of that atom is by taking the number of protons minus the number of electrons. You can see that if there's more electrons, we're going to get a negative charge. If there's more protons, we're going to have a positive charge. Um, and it's important to realize that atoms are only going to acquire this charge by losing or gaining electrons. They're never going to lose or gain protons in this process because if they did, then they would be turning into other elements. And that would actually be like nuclear fission, or uh, which we're not really going to get into here. So when the atom gains electrons, okay, it's going to get a negative charge, and we call that an anion, okay? When an atom loses one or more electrons, it's going to get a positive charge, okay? And we call that a cation. Um, to remember which is which here, I've always kind of thought, well, cats are positive, so cations must be the positive one. And anions are the other ones, so they're negative. So chemical symbols. Chemical symbols, you've probably seen these before. They're the symbols that you see on the periodic table. They're used to abbreviate um, elements. Uh, mercury, for instance, has a chemical symbol of Hg. Um, a lot of them were derived from like really old names that they had for the elements and stuff. Some of them are other languages and stuff. So they don't, they don't always make a lot of sense, um, to a native English speaker. Uh, but you know, you just kind of remember them. Uh, most of them have either one or two letters, but as they've been adding more and more elements, um, few of the newer ones down at the bottom actually have three letters. Uh, it's important to note that only the first letter, letter of the chemical symbol is capitalized. That's going to be important later when we have to write out um, various different formulas and stuff. Here is an example that's mercury in a jar with its little symbol HG on it. Here is a list of some of the more common elements and their symbols. So, you know, aluminum, we have AL, bromine, we have BR. Those ones all make pretty good sense, but every once in a while you get something like gold is going to be AU. This is from an ancient Latin word, aurum. Um, iron is going to be from ferrum, one of the old words for it. Um, and, you know, lead, we have PB from plumbum, which I really like that word. So the symbol for a specific isotope of an element is written by placing the mass number as the superscript to the left of the elemental symbol. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Down here we have magnesium. We have magnesium 24. Magnesium 25, that's going to have one more neutron than magnesium 24. Magnesium 26, it's going to have two more neutrons than magnesium 24, and one more neutron than magnesium 25. But all of these are all going to have the same 12 protons. 
here is a little breakdown of how we're going to write all of the things that we've talked about so far. You put the atomic number in the bottom left here. You're going to put the mass number in the top left here. Um, and you're going to have the charge up here in the top right. And in this book, they typically write it as a number followed by a charge. That's how I'm going to want you guys to do it in the homeworks and stuff when I ask for this. Um, some other texts, they'll actually write uh, plus and then two after that. Um, but this is the way that we're going to do it. Uh, so here's an example of isotopic abundance. So we have hydrogen. And hydrogen has three different forms. You can have protium with one neutron, you can have deuterium with two neutrons, or you can have tritium with three neutrons. Um, and you can see that they only differ in the number of neutrons that they have, and each one is therefore going to have a different mass. And they also have a different natural abundance. So 99.989% of the hydrogen you come across is going to be protium. Only 0.0115% is going to be deuterium. And tritium is so rare that it's difficult to say even how much there is. There's, we barely ever see any tritium. So we saw that... Um, we have to talk now about atomic mass. We saw that each proton and each neutron has a mass of approximately 1 AMU. Um, each electron weighs far less. Therefore, the atomic mass of a single atom in AMU is approximately equal to its mass number, but not quite. Um, but because most elements exist naturally as a mixture of two or more isotopes, the periodic table actually lists a weighted average of all of the isotopes present naturally occurring. That's where these longish um, mass values that you're going to see on the periodic table come from. So let's see an example of that. In order to do a weighted average, you're going to take the abundance of um, one of the isotopes and you're going to multiply it by its mass. Then you're going to add that to the abundance of the second one, multiply it by its mass, add that on and on until you've done all of the different uh, isotopes um, that that element has. We have uh, an example of this in our homework with a um, video that I did um, explaining this in a little bit more detail. But let's look at our example here. If 19.9% of boron is boron 10, and it has a mass of 10.0129 AMU, and 80.1% is boron 11, with a mass of 11.0093 AMU, then its average mass is going to be this value here as a decimal times its mass there plus this value as a decimal here times its mass and that's going to give us an average mass of 10.81 amu little sanity check we can see that that's between these two values and it's closer to the one that is more abundant The occurrence and natural abundances of isotopes can be experimentally determined using an instrument called a mass spectrometer. Um, basically, the samples are vaporized and then they are exposed to high energy electron beams and it kind of removes electrons from the sample, um, making them uh, charged. And then it's focused uh, through a onto a detector using magnets. So here's an example here. We start off with our sample and we heat it and then we hit it with this electron beam and we get it all good and ionized and then we have these uh, electrodes here that are going to accelerate it out as a like coherent particle beam and then we deflect it with the magnets and then it hits the detector and, and depending on where it hits on this detector we can tell 
what the mass is here. So if this has a, a pretty high uh, mass, then what it's going to do is it's not going to deflect very much, and it's going to strike right around here. If it has a low mass, then it's going to be deflected quite a bit, and it's going to strike more down here. And we can figure out the isotopic abundance if we put in a pure element in here. Um, these are actually used to do all sorts of really great science. Um, a lot of like CSI work and stuff where they inject something in and it tells them everything about who the, who the killer was and stuff. They're, they're using an equipment like a lot like this.